The designers in Silicon Valley, at Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, and so on, want your attention. And they're working tirelessly to create engaging products to swipe, click, and like. But when they succeed, is it with a hidden downside for the rest of us? Here to reflect on mental health in the digital world, Bruce Ballin, head of problem gambling, gaming, and internet addiction at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, that's CAMH, and he's the author of Swimming in Cyber. It's good to have you back here at TVO. Thanks for having me again. Can we just start with this? What do you do at CAMH? What's the mission? So at CAMH right now, I am helping lead the development of the problem gambling, gaming, and internet use services, more behavioral addiction activities, sort of addictions without substances. So it's all about gambling, video gaming, pornography, over, you know, shopping issues, all that sort of thing. I don't mean to be facetious here, but uh, business is up? Unfortunately, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, because? Well, technology is proliferating and people have more access to it and those who are vulnerable to developing issues, therefore, um, are being more exposed to the things that can get them into trouble. Like? Uh, again, said so like uh, once you have like your cell phone or a tablet and it opens you up to all sorts of things across the virtual world, you start looking at different sites and next thing you know, you might come across, oh, that's interesting shopping things or here's a video game. And because of the design of how these platforms are created, the same psychologists who help develop gambling games are being employed to develop all these techniques to embed into video games and shopping and all sorts of things hmm. that can draw people into behavioral problems unless they're wary. I don't want to be facetious about this, okay. but people often say, oh, I'm so addicted to my smartphone. Now, when they say it, they're not making a clinical diagnosis. But when you say it, are you making that clinical diagnosis? Yes, although I will say the whole thing about being addicted to something is sometimes used a bit frivolously. Mm -hmm. And again, it gets back to what is driving someone's behavior to get into trouble. Because sometimes it could be someone has some social anxiety, maybe someone has some other mental health issues, maybe someone's coping with some stresses, and they get into trouble using technology to soothe themselves. Mm. Um, so we always take our time to actually figure out why you're having this problem versus just labeling somebody with an addiction. But I have heard the expression used that, that the cell phone or the smartphone is now almost like a one-armed bandit in your pocket. You know, it, it, has, it has taken on the life of an addict at a casino who can't get away from the slot machine. Do you think that's accurate? Yeah, it has the potential. So not everyone falls prey to it. But the thing is, it is designed in ways that it has the same sort of psychological principles behind it, such as intermittent reinforcement. If you remember Pavlov's dog experiments about things and, oh, you have an email, a little buzz, and it's intermittent. So it's like, oh, what's going on? What's going on? And unless you're aware of it, it starts to draw you in. Also, the whole concept about the virtual worlds are 365 days a year, maybe 366 on leap years, you know? <laughs> yes. But because it's always happening, when you're not on it, you get curious. What is going on? What and am so I missing? On. What's, yeah, and the way things are designed for quick hits of stresses and rewards, it just starts to get people more potentially hooked onto the behaviors. You keep using the word design. So you, you are saying, I should ask, are you saying, that these devices that we rely on so much now and that are in our pockets, it seems, 24-7, are actually designed by the Silicon Valley folks to addict us. I wouldn't say it like that, but I will say they are designed to be uh, engaging and get people involved with it and get them immersed with a lot of the activities that you can use it. I don't think they necessarily want to create addiction. I can't say that, but I will say because of the engagement and the ability to get people involved so much, people do have the problematic uh, behaviors developing, we're vulnerable to this. Well, that's addiction, isn't it? I, don't, I mean, I, I don't think anybody's mm. too fussed about the fact that these things are engaging. Of course they're engaging. They're lots of fun to deal with and all of that. But there's a big gap between that and some kind of actual emotional addiction to the thing where you can't get off it, isn't it? Well, exactly. But again, not everyone would qualify for being addicted to it. They might have problematic use. Again. The reason why I'm kind of like skirting around the word addiction is there's lots of stigma associated with it. And I would like to have people who are thinking they're having problems with the technology or screen time don't get turned off like, I'm an addict, so this is horrible. We're saying, well, I've got problematic use with it. Hmm. It is affecting my life in negative ways. It's affecting my health. It's affecting my relationships. I should do something about this. And a lot of people 
probably do have problems with this technology, and probably some people do have qualified uh, to the level of addiction. Now, you're a psychiatry guy. Yes, so I So I want to ask you about the Bible of psychiatry. Okay. The DSM, right? Mm -hmm. Diagnostic Statistical Manual. Yes, indeed. Uh, does this belong in that? Well, again, there is some controversy around should it be in there, and there's like right now, I'll say behavioral addictions, which video gaming and all these things fall under, they have at least taken gambling out of this little area called uh, intermittent, uh, sorry, impulsive disorders, not otherwise specified, and actually pulled gambling at least into the addiction realm, saying, oh yeah, this is an addiction, like gambling. And video game use and all this can be very similar to gambling. In the uh, diagnosis of interest, so that hasn't been officially recognized, that video game addiction now. But it does get back to, is it just video gaming? Because when we talk about internet addiction, I would say, what actually does that mean? It could be, are you video gaming? Are you shopping? Are you looking at pornography? Are you using social media? It all falls under there. And it's important for us to understand, why is a person actually doing this behavior so we can actually figure out proper treatments for them? Uh, well, if you need treatment, it's because presumably your body and or mind, your intellect and or emotions, are having uh, problems. And, and I want to look at the other side of it, which, which is, you know, if we say drugs, you know, to get off drugs, you, you get the DTs and you go through all of that as you mm -hmm. try to get off harmful drugs. Do people who have an ad addiction to technology experience the same kinds of withdrawal pangs when they're not allowed to use it? Well, clinically speaking, we see something similar to it, especially in our clinic over at CAMH. And it's because, again, when somebody's so hyped up with all these hits and intermittent reinforcement and they're constantly engaged and you suddenly take it away, they're suddenly not sure what to do. Hmm. And they might feel like it's withdrawal, but it's like, what am I supposed to do? There's lots of kids now go, I'm bored, I'm bored, I don't know what to do. Because they haven't learned the skills now just to sit with themselves, be mindful and just kind of look around hmm. because they're so into something else. So yes, that we do see similar things and people build tolerance to it. The withdrawal symptoms, there's hazardous use like driving and texting, driving and playing a game. So in, there's a lot of similarities to addiction there and having the same type of symptoms. You know, you just reminded me, and we've got this clip, I think, standing by here, the, the driving and texting and how we are horrified at that moment where we're waiting at a light and we haven't got something to immediately engage us. I'm going to quote a great philosopher here, okay? This is Louis C.K., one of the best yes, indeed. on the predicament you just described. Go ahead, Sheldon. I think these things are toxic. I don't think they, especially for kids. It's just this thing, it's bad. And right. they, they don't look at people when they talk to them and they don't build the empathy. You know, kids are mean and it's because they're trying it out. <laughs> they, they look at a kid and they go, you're fat. And then they see the kid's face scrunch up and they go, ooh, that doesn't feel good to make a person do that. Right. But, they, but they gotta start with doing the mean thing. But when they write you're fat, then they just go, mmm, um, that was fun, I like that. <laughs> so, that tasted good. Yeah, exactly, you need, the thing is, I, you need to build an ability to just be yourself and not be doing something. That's what the phones yes. are taking away. Yes. Is the ability to just sit there, like this. That's being a person. And he goes on to talk about waiting at the stoplight and so on and not having anything to do. How, do, if we're addicted to the internet, how do you treat an internet addiction? Well, as I said before, the first thing is to understand what's driving the behaviors in the first place. But even some real basic things, is like, do you have actually limits set? Healthy limits. We have like physical space and time limits for most things, but people don't consider virtual limits like, oh, when should I be on the net? Uh, where should I be accessing the net? What sort of content is healthy for me? And so on. Uh, families figuring out, before I bring in technology and let all my youth be exposed to it, what is the rules around these sorts of things? When should I answer the phone? When should I answer a text? Uh, how quickly should I do that? Just to become conscious of it. So as Louis is saying, you know, just when you're sitting here like this, wondering, it's like, actually, I should be thinking about how am I setting healthy boundaries around technology? So that's one thing, just real basic things. But then again, if people are running into difficulties because of concurrent mental health issues, then get the mental health issues treated. Mm. If it's due to family dynamics, which we often see because it's like, well, who's paying for all this technology use and all that? We have to get the family involved and they have to start to set 
healthy boundaries and understand what is the point of using technology in our family and when. Have you seen that cartoon on the internet where, where you've got sort of 15 people sitting on three different couches in grandma's living room and grandma is the only person of the 15 not sitting there on their device? I mean, that would be hilarious if it weren't so true. I presume you see this kind of thing all the time. I see it all the time, and this gets back to, to me, this is about public health uh, issues as well, that we talk about safe sex and uh, how, you know, warnings about how to use drugs or not use drugs. But no one's putting out, you know, guidelines around healthy use of technology. Because again, we're not at CAMH against technology. We're about healthy use of technology. Yeah, there's no point being against it. It's with us. It's with us. So it's this like healthy eating, healthy anything, mm. healthy use of technology. But again, yeah, when the society allows these things to occur, more deviances occur where everyone says, okay, we're going to kind of, we think we're all more connected, but we're actually disconnected more and more. And it's not just in homes. I see it in work meetings, in hospitals, everybody in their own little virtual bubbles. Yeah. Is Louis right in as much as he gave the example of, of the kids who are taunting appallingly online and not feeling a thing, but it's harder to do it when you're actually uh, looking at the person as we are right now. Is he right that that would sort of uh, delay the development of empathy in other people? Well, again, it's possible and it's likely, I would say. There's no research yet showing it, but the thing is it's hard to be empathic if you're not present. Being present with somebody else actually is necessary to have empathy. And if you're actually divided away from them or dissociated away through these screens and so on and don't really connect, how can you have the empathy? Hmm. Does this feel like to you a moment of reckoning? It, like a, wondering if we're kind of at a fulcrum in, in history. Up until now, it's all been one way with technology. It's more, more, more. Let's see more, more what we can do. We're starting to see the beginnings of a backlash against it right now, as you mentioned. Let's put some boundaries around it. Let's find out when is a good time to do it, when is not a good time to do it, like at the dinner table. Are we at one of those moments in history, in your view? I believe it's like, yes, it's a moment that's kind of stretched over time, just like we're dealing with people with gambling issues. Gambling's still socially accepted, you know, and we're slowly getting to pointing out those issues. We're nowhere near like with tobacco. We say, oh yeah, look, there's actual real evidence showing harm. Hmm. We can all see it and from uh, evidence-informed approaches, pulling from media studies and simulation studies, this internet issues have potential huge negative effects. So again, we're at that process of, I think, having the discussion. I mean, we're going around to many schools, organizations. Everyone's talking about it now, at least, which is good Pick because we're on, on it. Yeah, talking about schools in our last 30 seconds here. At what age should you give your child a smartphone or an iPad? That's a good question. I would say at the age where you feel as a parent that you're still responsible for them and you're able to give it to them and you feel they understand it and that you're still taking responsibility to oversee and guide them and make sure you're looking at how much time are they on it, what's the purpose of it, and so on. Uh, so I'm probably not age two, probably not age four, but somewhere around eight, nine, ten. It all depends. It depends on the maturity of the child and making sure you're not just handing them like basically, not a loaded gun, but it's similar. Just yeah. say, here, go play. And next thing you know, they're hooked on it and looking at pornography. You don't want any eight-year-old doing that. No. All right. Uh, Bruce, it's good of you to come back and visit us at TVO tonight. Thanks so much. And I guess we would say that um, for more information, what's the name of that book of yours? Uh, Swimming in Cyber. It's a free book I wrote just because I got tired of telling parents all the same things over. So it's a free download on the net. Fantastic. Bruce Ballin, University of Toronto and CAMH. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.